All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna to try to get started. So if you could all have a seat. All right, thank you. My name is Carol Lee and I am president of the National Academy. I am here instead for Pam no, Rosen, our vice president. Now you can do the coffers, but you're not here, so there, you fire on, give me the drink and lunch. Okay. Because I have cataracts and these bright lights. Are you want soup? Out. But anyway, so she thank you all soup, for yeah. being here. We come together at an extremely challenging time in our world. The polarization that will be addressed by our first plenary, chaired by Janelle Scott, has increased dramatically since we put this program together. You think the October about it, attack on that Israel that and the subsequent okay. violence in Gaza have evoked yeah. deep reactions across our country and world and long simmering issues around free speech, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia have come to a boil, particularly on college campuses where so many of us work and study. So we want to begin by acknowledging the pain and anger of so many of our members and express our grief for all the lives lost and the suffering of those who are living in fear. So where do we go from here? Education can and should play a vital role in creating the opportunity for people from radically different perspectives to learn from one another, to create spaces for discourses that doesn't retreat into overly simplistic binaries, and to support people in continuing to thrive <clears throat> for a deeper understanding. So perhaps it's, a fitting, it's fitting that our first plenary session, chaired by Professor Janelle Scott, Academy member and president-elect of AERA, will address issues related that's right. Yeah. We'll address issues related to polarization and the politicization of education in the United States and how we as educational researchers can play a role. This plenary will contextualize the deep political contestations we are seeing playing out in schools in our country, highlight particular community and legal responses and examine the role that the academy can play in using research to support educators, parents, and guardians, students, and communities. The format will provide opportunities both to hear from the full panel, which reflects a variety of disciplinary perspectives, and then to join a small group with one panel member to dig deeper into these particular uh, foci. We will then return to this room for a summary discussion among panel members that brings together the different small group discussions. Tomorrow, our second uh, plenary, chaired by Ken Codinger, the Hillman professor at Carnegie Mellon University, who focuses on human computer interaction, will dig into the opportunities and challenges that the latest forms of generative AI pose for education. The speakers will engage issues related to how human use of such systems and AI more generally may disrupt education as we know it. We will especially focus on how AI in education research is pursuing the many opportunities AI may afford, while also highlighting and addressing the ethical challenges that may ensue. In addition to presentations and an interactive discussion among panel members, we'll also hear from our NAED Spencer Fellows about how they're using AI in their own research. With that, I'll turn it over to Janelle Scott to introduce this panel. Thank you, Carolyn. We miss Pam Grossman, uh, oh, certainly, and thank her for all the planning that went into this panel. And I also wanna thank Amy Berman for um, supporting this panel and helping us uh, to put it together, as well as Abby for um, coordinating all the details. Uh, so. I want to begin uh, just um, to mention that we started this conversation last year at last year's fall retreat. Um, and as Carol indicated, politics have only intensified in um, um, very, very um, in inflected ways, right? So what I'd like to do just for a few minutes is, is review what's at stake, what, um, what's, what the terrain is right now. Um, some of this will be old information and some of this might be new information, but just so we have a level set. Um, so we know that Christopher Rufo began his attacks on critical race theory just four months after the televised murder of George Floyd in 2020 and the subsequent global outpouring of actions against racism 
Uh, since then, since 2021, there are 44 state legislatures have enacted bans on teaching so-called divisive concepts or what advocates have labeled the teaching of critical race theory. We also know that these bills have failed to pass through some legislatures, such as in Indiana in 2022, and that they are being successfully litigated against in many states. Seven states currently censor discussions of LGBTQ people or issues, and private organizations have now begun to allow censorship of content. If you see the recent controversies around the scholastic book fairs and having so-called diverse books available um, or for schools to elect to not have them available. And even the College Board has been embroiled in controversy around whether they are suppressing content in African, AP African American Studies courses. New political actors and existing organizations are providing financial and political background loans for these legislative and regulatory efforts. Um, organizations like Moms for Liberty, Citizens for Renewing America, what? Manhattan Natural. Institute, the Heritage Foundation, uh -huh. and the American First With what? Institute, and for example. Uh -huh. We also had a Supreme Court ruling in Carson v. Macon yeah. in 2022 yeah. that established that religious schools can no longer be excluded like, from state tuition not programs. Not Chris um, goes, yeah. but, along uh, with this you know, right, since yeah, 2020, uh, 20 uh, states have extended okay. voucher yeah. into a tax credit yeah. Advocates yeah. arguing yeah. that school yeah. choice yeah. as a policy can allow families yeah. to further okay. select schools that align with their religious values or their curricular preferences around the teaching of race and history. And so we know that teachers and school leaders continue to be under pressure and scrutiny, and public education, pre-K through 16, is under attack. This charge context then calls us today to consider several important issues. Our panelists representing different roles and research expertise, including perspectives from political science, history, law, and teachers unions, will help to situate what's happening and how researchers are or could be responding. Our format today is designed to maximize interaction and collaboration. To that end, each panelist will speak for about seven minutes. Next, we will transition to breakout rooms where each panelist will facilitate a conversation with you. We will provide room information at the end of our panelists' comments. And then following these breakout conversations, we're gonna reconvene in this room where our panelists will offer some closing reflections. So we are so fortunate to have such a wonderful set of speakers. I now turn to them. We're going to proceed not quite in the order that they're sitting. <laughs> um, first, we'll have Jeff Hennig, a professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. And then we will have Elizabeth Todd Braylon. Oh, yeah, you're going next after. Oh, no. Is that not right? I thought this was the order of people. OK. I'm just going to let them do what they want to do. <laughs> at some point, we'll have Elizabeth Todd Breland. Um, <laughs> Uh, we'll have Susan Nogan from the National Ed Education Association and Leah Watson from the ACLU. Uh, so with that, I turn it over to Jeff. That's for sure. Right, Jeff? <laughs> uh, the dominant narrative about education politics and policy through the last century was of a highly decentralized process of decision making largely buffered from partisan politics and national conflicts, characterized by low turnout elections and poorly attended school board meetings in which issues discussed were parochial and particular and often pragmatically resolved. That narrative is overly simplistic as others on this panel, I think are gonna probably mention local school politics has often included sharp controversies like battles over creationism or school prayer and racial integration and the appearance of local consensus uh, at the local at the district level often masked deep inequities and injustices that went unvoiced but that said there is something new and qualitatively distinct about the kinds of conflicts we're seeing in local school board elections and meetings in very recent times, where campaigns were once largely self and family funded, amounting to a few hundred dollars for posters and flyers. Today is often include large donations from outside organizations and individuals, sophisticated messaging and even costly TV ads and where public testimony at local board meetings was often limited and board deliberations carried out it behind closed doors, 
Today, it's not uncommon to see news coverage about angry protesters shouting down and occasionally threatening school board members and other attendees with whom they disagree. Substantively, too, the agenda of school boards has shifted first from a heavy focus on money and facilities. Should we uh, build a new sports stadium? Uh, should we, um, where should we construct a new middle school? Um, to um, questions coincident with NCLB, with No Child Left Behind, more attention to measurable academic outcomes, and most recently, various culture war issues about around pandemic policies, teaching about race, and handling issues related to gender identity. What I'm going to focus on in, in, in my remaining time is three broad structures, structural changes in the landscape of education politics, and how these have changed the array of actors involved and the kinds of issues brought to the fore. These three have to do with centralization, uh, the expanded role of general purpose uh, governance institutions and officials, I'll say more about what that means, and nationalization, which is not the same thing as centralization, as I'll explain. My claim is that these changes have altered the rules of the game under which school politics is played out, and in doing so have brought new actors, new ideas, and new sentiments into the fray. They've also increased what, might, what one might call the contagion effect, so that skirmishes that once would have been localized and short-lived become fueled, echoed, and strategically reseeded by national actors using local school politics to gain advantage in broader political battles. So centralization, the first of these structural changes is most familiar, I think, to everyone here, so I'll say less about it, perhaps. Um, but beginning about 50 years ago, first states and then the national government have become much more active in education issues, more willing to stick their fingers into areas previously left to local control. Part of this was led by a handful of Southern governors who recognized that improving education was a viable path towards attracting business. Part had to do with state court decisions about school finance that shifted the funding and the control of the purse strings to a greater extent to state capitals, leading governors and legislatures to pay more attention to how money in education was spent. Part had to do with racial and ethnic shifts in local power, leaving predominantly white and largely Republican in many states, suburban and rural legislators who are more comfortable with clipping the wings of black and brown majorities concentrated in urban school districts. The second broad trend uh, has to do with a horizontal shift rather than a vertical shift. Centralization was a vertical shift in power, a horizontal shift at each level of government between education specific and general purpose institutions and actors. In the US, most of the important and high profile domestic policy issues are handled by general purpose governments Things like municipalities, counties, states, and national government, state legislatures, Congress. The decision makers in these governments oversee a wide range of functions and have to set priorities among them and ideally attend to spillover effects, both positive and negative. Um, they're not necessarily interested primarily or even in some instances at all in education per se. Education in contrast, has been largely delegated historically to school-specific institutions, especially at the local level, where the power has resided in school boards and superintendents, um, but also at the state level. Um, uh, historically, um, uh, state boards of education had considerable um, uh, responsibility. The shift towards general purpose governance was most visible in the move towards mayoral control of schools in large cities like Chicago, Boston, New York, and Washington, DC. But, and, and I don't have time to talk about this at length, but, um, but at the state level also, and actually earlier, there's a shift from uh, often independently elected state boards of education uh, and state superintendents to a growing gubernatorial role in directly 
um, controlling the uh, membership of, of state boards of education and chief state school officers. Currently, there's a battle like, along these lines going on in Ohio where the governor has um, uh, moved to make all of the state board's members uh, governor, gubernatorial appointees instead of allowing voters to elect 11 of them, which has been the case. Uh, third broad structural shift is nationalization. Um, it's related to centralization, but it's a distinct phenomenon in many ways. Centralization has to do with moving formal authority up the federal ladder. Nationalization refers to the growing penetration of local uh, politics by national interest groups and national actors who believe that local uh, arenas are uh, uh, convenient places for making their case, for recruiting their activists, and for um, changing the implementation of education policy. Why are these shifts important? So I, 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 I I'm, I'm going to quickly summarize by saying I find these things interesting and analogous to changing the rules of the game in sports, changing whether there's a designated hitter in in baseball or uh, changing the introducing a three point rule in basketball. Changes in the rules of the game don't alter the game fundamentally. A lot of the game looks the same but different skill sets and different actors benefit under different uh, sets of rules. And that's the case in politics and governance as well. Governance institutional niches um, are uh, serve decision makers uh, who have their own rules of the game, their own traditions, their own norms of access, their own criteria for choosing among options. Uh, so shifts in the importance of different governance arenas vertically or horizontally, alter the type of resources that matter uh, and don't determine the outcomes, but tilt the probabilities. So my big wind up here, I'll, I'll probably have two if they don't you know, pull me off the stage. So the new landscape I wanna suggest is less responsive to local context, less familiar with the nitty gritty of pedagogy and curriculum less deferential to educators and teachers unions in particular, more attentive to themes and ideas from non-education policy areas, often less motivated by visions of improving education practice than by partisan talking points and tactical uses of education to appeal to swing voters in swing legislative districts and, and, and states. Um, so as a final point, I wanna say that it's, it's an important question to consider, and, and I'm, I'm inviting those who join me in the breakout room to do this in a, per, in a particular way, which is how should we navigate in this new landscape? I just want to end by saying I think there's you know, a, a diff, couple of different ways to ask that question, uh, and, uh, and in my breakout session, I'll try to uh, give the group who shows up a, a little bit of agency about which ones we focus on. But one is one, sh how should advocates and education organizations best engage? And another is how we as individual researchers or as uh, the, the academy, uh, as an organization, how could we uh, respond in an environment that's increasingly penetrated by partisan and ideological political issues? Do we lean into the science and our methodology or are there ways that we need to think creatively about how we act within the political sphere as well? Thank you. Abby, can we, oh, we're going to switch. Go ahead, these are yours. All right, good afternoon, everyone. All right, um, I am Susie Nogan from the National Education Association. I want to thank Janelle for inviting me and the Academy for having me and all of you for being here. I think this is a really important conversation, and I'm honored to be a part of it, so thank you. 
which is the clicker? Is it? Oh, yay. So just a little roadmap of where we're going. Um, how, did, how did we get here this time? Because uh, as we will hear, politicization is not new um, and we can turn the bus around. Um, and then we'll either here or, or particularly in the breakout session, what role do we all have as individuals um, and as, as scholars and as, as the academy, right? Next one. Okay. Um, scary stories, right? Um, so we're going to start with the map and work our way counterclockwise. And the map reveals where um, demographic changes were most significant. So in dark green, there was a demographic shift of 20% or more between the 2010 and the 2020 census. Medium green is 10% or more. Light green is 5% or more. So the country is becoming more colorful. And many of us think that's a good thing. And then there are some of us that get very anxious about that um, because they see a loss of power and prestige and privilege. So that is the context, um, one of the contexts that, that we were encountering. Um, then we have COVID, spring of 2020, um, and school board meetings um, are experiencing some strife over mask mandates and vaccines and school closures and um, what I would call the Trump effect where people are allowed to lose their minds and behave in ways that they wouldn't allow their children to. Um, sorry, I, I learned recently that being called a seasoned expert really means I'm salty. So there we go. Um, so we kept this, the summer of racial reckoning um, where the murder of George Floyd capped a series of racially motivated murders. Um, and it tipped public sentiment, at least for the moment. Um, so in addition to street protests that involved millions of people, there were um, businesses that responded by adopting policies of diversity, equity, and inclusion and providing staff training and employers who provided staff training so that people could address implicit bias and become anti-racist, hopefully, theoretically. Um, and schools were part of this too. Schools were already involved because see demographic change exhibit A. The schools are changing, they're, they're on the advance edge of demographic change. So they were responding to their student populations and having affinity groups to provide um, support um, and social and emotional supports during that summer of racial reckoning. They were adopting DEI policies, they were supporting their students and providing professional development training to staff to address issues of implicit bias and to ensure that the institutions of um, white supremacy were being taught, which triggered more backlash. So there's backlash to the backlash. And one of the employers that instituted um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training and implicit bias training was the city of Seattle. And the training materials that the city of Seattle offered, oh, wow, um, um, were leaked to a struggling documentary filmmaker named Chris Rufo. And it found a receptive audience. It got picked up by the Manhattan Institute and all of a sudden he's on a national stage and he's talking to Tucker Carlson and can look directly into the camera and speak to the president. So we get an executive order banning the use of federal funds to fund diversity, equity, inclusion training in the federal government and with contractors. So Chris Rufo is on DEI, then he discovers critical race theory and creates this label that everything he doesn't like, he's gonna dump into the CRT label and it's a dog whistle. And it, it, it appeals to C exhibit A map, this population that is experiencing some existential anxiety over their changing role um, in this country. Next one. So this is the perfect storm we've got anxious people and we've got political operatives who are willing and ready to take advantage of it. What else is going on 
education is a multi-billion dollar industry. Private sector wants to get a piece of it. There's ideology. Um, libertarians do not believe that public education is an appropriate function of government. This is an individual responsibility and their taxes go up to pay for other people's children, not liking it. There are also religious ideologues who would prefer to have public funding toward, toward their religious ideology in their schools or take their religious ideology and bring it into public schools. Politics, as I mentioned, I'm from the union. We're engaged in the politicization. Well, we got, we got engaged. Um, Nonpartisan, I don't care what letter comes after your name. If you're supporting a public education agenda, let's go. Um, but unions are strong and they are politically engaged and they're opposing a, the rest of a libertarian agenda. So we got to take down the unions. And finally, control. Educated people are capable, okay, um, of effecting change. Um, critical thinkers with advocacy, advocacy skills can challenge the status quo. People who know history can contextualize current events. Um, creative thinkers and problem solvers can imagine a different future. And none of that fits with a vision of education that focuses on rote learning and basic proficiency designed to churn out low wage workers who are willing to accept their assigned roles. So that's really depressing. Next slide. Um, actually, there is good news, and I can go through this in more detail in the breakout session, but that message is not resonating with the voters. Candidates who are on a pro-public education platform are winning. So I want to leave with, with good news. And next one. What I'd like to talk about in the, the breakout session is what our roles are. As individuals, we are all members of communities. So we have roles that we can take as individuals. As scholars, I would really like more research that supports that I'm not a left-wing conspiracy theor theorist wacko. Like, th this is real. Um, but also the research that supports that. Um, what the other CRT? Sorry, my, my mind went blank because she said to stop talking. Um, but the, the research on uh, that honest history, that action civics, that culturally responsive teaching is good for all students, that's research that we need. Um, we also need researchers who can work with journalists and with advocates to translate the research into resources that can support the advocacy that we need. And institutionally, what can we do all together? So I'm going to stop there because I went over time and I apologize. Um, good afternoon, everyone. While I'm waiting for my slides to come up, I just wanna also thank President Carol Lee, thank Janelle Scott. Um, really excited to be here today. And I, I was reflecting on the fact that I was a postdoctoral fellow in 2016. And at this moment, because of when the NAD meets in 2016, I was, um, it was right after the Trump election. And I remember sort of fears and dread and disbelief by some, but I think also for others of us, it was kind of a confirmation of what we know or knew about our country. And I think about now as we're living through our government using our tax dollars to fund weapons for genocide in Palestine and understanding, having an understanding of the logics of our settler colonial state doesn't make it less horrific. Um, so I just wanna hold that and also not making equivalencies there, but rather to highlight, I think the recurring sense of crisis and grief and the world being on fire and then them asking, well, let's talk about politicization and crises. And I was like, which one, right? So. Here we are today talking about this one. And I think it, it's important because it speaks to the erasure of history and of knowledge. Um, and that resonates differently, but in, in I think important ways across these different state, uh, spaces. Um, so I wanna suggest that my research, which focus on black struggles for education, suggests that these current attacks on curricula and books and knowledge is part of a longer um, recurring tradition of massive resistance to civil rights gains 
and the very presence of black people in public space. And I also wanna talk about something that's come up a little bit already about this tension between the idea of education as a public good and education as a private good. Um, so if we go to the next. So, um, you know, historian David Lavery talks about how for most of US history, public education was understood as a public good, something necessary for democracy and equality um, that benefited everyone in the community. Clearly aspirational, right? At various moments in history, people were wholesale excluded from this vision. But I would argue that black education struggles understood public education as a public good, dating back to at least reconstruction where we see the foundations for our modern um, public education system being developed by African-Americans. And I think about my colleague Jarvis Gibbons and the story that he tells at the beginning of his book um, about a black teacher under Jim Crow reading from one text under a desk to provide a curriculum and education that affirmed her black students, but under the desk so that the eyes of any sort of state regulators that came through wouldn't see it. And that clandestine type of learning and teaching that in some ways we're seeing again today. Certainly also civil rights era organizers struggled nationally to make a democratic vision of public education as a public good, a reality for black communities. And nationally through this, we see the racist response to black civil rights gains, advancing this idea of public education as a private good. And that this was a major departure from previous understandings. Um, particularly since the mid 20th century, public education as a private good has been articulated through ideas of school choice and parents' rights. So after Brown v. Board required Southern schools to desegregate, white parents demanded school choice to use public funds for tuition wa waivers, what we might call vouchers today, and attend segregated all white private schools deemed segregation academies. This racist backlash was supported by um, intellectual thought as well by conservative University of Chicago economist Milton Friedman's market-based approach to privatizing public education. However, I would say that these were still kind of fringe ideas during this period, right? And didn't really take hold until the 90s. In the 1990s, we see the corporate reorganization, not just of public education, but really of the public sphere more broadly. And this strong bipartisan embrace of private sector business models of efficiency and accountability to be imposed upon public goods, particularly schools, um, hyper accountability, hyper standardization, the bipartisan support for no child left behind and race to the top and school choice policies like the expansion of privately managed charter schools, a narrow focus on standardized test scores and high stakes punitive accountability policies that sorted students as individuals for their individual gains as consumers, where some students got ahead and others didn't, again here treating public education as a, pub, as a private good. So these seeds of privatization and public education planted, as we can see in some ways, in sort of a racist response to civil rights gains and in Friedman type plans for privatizing public education bloom during this era. So I'm a historian, but I do not believe that history repeats itself. I would suggest it rhymes though. And since the early 2000s, parents, students, community organizations, and social justice unions in my city, Chicago, places like the Chicago Teachers Union, fought back against education privatization. Um, they promoted a vision for fully resourced public schools as community hubs and as necessary public goods. We saw the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and the 2020 uprisings, as mentioned earlier, demanding racial justice and demanding a racial reckoning, even if not fulfilled. Moreover, I would say that COVID, the COVID crisis demonstrated that public schools truly are in many ways um, the last thread of what's a pretty threadbare social safety net in this country, not only as an essential public good for learning or ideals of democracy, again, whether achieved or not, but for universal access to food, um, for health care, for social services, for community care. So again, though, we see massive resistance to the in the form of these new parents' rights movements, banning books, burying history, attacking LGBTQ folks. And like their predecessors, these groups have latched on to school choice policies and parents' rights rhetoric. So school choice policies have harmed public school students by siphoning off public resources to fund privatized education and promoting privatization of public education that has facilitated in many ways the attacks on queer and trans students and on teaching about race and gender. So I'm gonna shift from my historian self to my school board self. I'm the vice president of the school board in Chicago Public Schools. 
And as a school board member in Chicago, I haven't borne the brunt of this in the same way as some of my colleagues across the country, but I also wanna say it's not something that just happens in those places over there. It touches us everywhere that we are. Um, and the reality is, as we think about how to use research in these spaces, many policymakers aren't particularly interested in research that doesn't support their pre-existing beliefs. I would say though, there is a there, there are some that do. <laughs> and for those of us who are, I think research on the importance of culturally responsive pedagogy and research on the perils and equities and financial mismanagement in the privatized education sphere is can be a bulwark, can be an armor, can be a tool that we can use in the struggle for a more just educational system and world. And for me, history, learning from the past to better understand and strategize for the present is an essential both worldview and tool in this space. So I'm happy to talk in the breakout session more about school board life and wildness, but also about these longer histories that I think tell us something about our current moment. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity to speak with you and also to talk to you more at the breakout session. I just wanna pick up on some of the threads that we've heard so far. We've heard from Susan about Christopher Rufo and really igniting this hysteria around critical race theory starting around August or September of 2020. We heard from Janelle about just the prevalence of these anti-critical race theory laws across the country introduced in 44 states, passed as laws in 17 states. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what is the impact of these laws and how can we fight them? Next slide, please. So um, even though this came up almost right beneath our noses um, in the past three years, we are in a position now where we're fighting to get back to the status quo that we said in 2020 was insufficient because it did not serve. And, public and education has never fully served the rights of BIPOC students. Now we're in a situation where we have 35% of K-12 students or 17.7 million students who are attending districts that have experienced some form of censorship efforts. These efforts are not limited to the K-12 space. They're also prevalent in the higher ed space. And the result has been exactly what its proponents predicted. We've seen silence instruction about racism, sexism, um, both educators censoring themselves on topics that are banned, their fear and in, a, a culture of fear and intimidation. So they're censoring themselves on topics that aren't explicitly banned. Sometimes, you know, educators have said they don't even know how to talk about current events that are racially motivated violence because they can't talk about it accurately with their students. And so teachers are forced to say, I don't know when students ask about current events or to, you know, try to present both sides of an argument which got a lot of notoriety in Texas where teachers were explaining both sides of the Holocaust as if that was something that should be taught to students. Um, and we've just seen syllabi curriculum changing an influx of book bans with over 1200 book challenges in 2022 and overall just a very hard situation for both educators and students. So the next slide is what are we gonna do about this? And the ACLU has filed litigation in New Hampshire, Oklahoma, and Florida challenging education, educational gag orders. There's been a lot of discussion about educational gag orders. So I just wanted to take some time to show you what is actually in the text of the Stop Woke Act, and then we can talk about these reactions on the other side. So the Stop Woke Act prohibits training or instruction that espouses, promotes, advances, and cold cakes, or compels an individual to believe eight prohibited concepts. I didn't have room on the slide to get all eight here, so I pulled three out. Um, but just looking at them, I, I just want you to think about what these actually mean. I will also flag that these prohibitions are for K through 20. So the first prohibited concept is that a person's moral character or status as either privileged or oppressed is necessarily determined by his or her race, color, national origin, or sex. Also that members of one race, color, national origin, or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race, color, national origin, or sex. And then the third example is that a person by virtue of his or her race, color, sex, or national origin bears personal responsibility for and must feel guilt, anguish, or other forms of psychological distress because of actions in which the person played no part committed in the past by other members of the same race, color, national origin, or sex. 
And then at the end of the law, there's this disclaimer language that concepts can be discussed in an objective manner and without endorsement. So the ACLU has brought a number of constitutional claims challenging this law and similar laws. The first one here, you see a sign that says, do this, not that. By that, I just mean we brought a claim under the First Amendment that these laws are viewpoint-based discrimination because they limit instructors to one view and not the other. Just looking at the first bullet point, you can say, an instructor can say within the bounds of the law that white privilege is not real. What they can't say is that decades of research across different um, sectors establish the existence of white privilege. Here to the right, um, we have a student, I thought it was a student who looked confused. And we've also brought First Amendment claims based on a student's right to information that in the high school and especially in the collegiate or higher education space, students have a right to be presented with all types of material and to determine for themselves what they believe. And so that's a violation of the student's First Amendment rights. On the second row, we have this guy who looks confused because frankly I am by some of these concepts. And when you think about this second concept, what does it mean to say you cannot and should not attempt to treat someone without respect to their race, color, or national origin or sex? That's a vagueness claim under the 14th Amendment where it's a due process a fairness, um, basically an element of fairness. You can't punish people when there's not clarity between prohibited and protected conduct. And then lastly, we have um, Governor DeSantis here with his favorite word, woke, a lot in the background. And we've also brought 14th Amendment claims that the law targets Black students and educators. And there we're pulling in statements from Governor DeSantis, other policymakers, legislators, about what they sought to address and erase from classroom with passing these laws. Next slide, please. So um, the first case I'll talk about is Purnell v. Lamb. We have the four claims that I just mentioned. This case was filed in the Northern District of Florida. Um, in August of last year, in November, we obtained an amazing order blocking the state from enforcing the higher education provisions of the law. Not surprisingly, the state of Florida appealed um, in December. They also sought to set aside this order so they could keep enforcing the law until the 11th Circuit decides the case. And that, stay, that request for stay was denied. We were briefing the um, case before the 11th Circuit in June. We'll be arguing the case in January. And so this case has been moving the furthest. Next slide, please. The first challenge to an educational gag order um, in the country is Burt v. O'Connor. We filed this in, o in Oklahoma. Basically, we filed in Oklahoma in September of 2021. Nothing has happened for almost two years, but we do have um, an oral argument before Judge Goodwin in December of 2023 on about, there were about 10 motions outstanding, and so we're hoping for resolution soon. And then the final slide is Mejia v. Edelbud. It's Consolidated is Local 8027. This is a case that's brought on behalf of teachers um, and involves the AFT and NEA teachers unions. The only claim in our case is vagueness. And this case has been ongoing, survived a motion to dismiss, um, and the court is going to decide on summary judgment briefing soon. So this case will have resolution soon. I would love to keep talking to you about why educational gag orders matter, what you see as the risk, because one thing that has become clear to us is that judges do not understand how academics work. And what, and we want to be sure that we capture the full scope of risk, what you can do to support that work, what we can do to support your work. And so I hope you come to the breakout session. Thank you. Well, how about another round of applause for our panelists? Thank you so much. Okay, so this is the part where it gets interactive. Um, Abby, are we gonna put the slide up with the rooms? So, you know, it's often said that trying to get researchers to do things is like herding cats, but I, I think it's much worse. So uh, <laughs> what we want you to do is decide which of our excellent panelists you want to engage in, in deeper conversation with. Um, if it's Jeff Hennig, you'll go to the lecture room. If it's Susan Nogan, you'll go to uh, 125, Elizabeth Todd Breland, uh, 120, and Leah Watson, uh, the members room. So please try, do your best, keep your conversations to a minimum. 
um, and join our panelists and then we will reconvene at the end. Thank you. Hello, hello, testing. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Can I, I won't tell you, but it is working. So we, we only have about 15 minutes uh, to bring this uh, session to a close. And I just wanted uh, to start, uh, first of all, thank you all for engaging in the small groups. It sounds like all of the, the conversations were very generative. Uh, so I just wanted to turn to our panelists and just if there's anything that came up in your conversations uh, that you wanted to bring back to the, the bigger group or anything that you didn't get to say in your um, seven minutes that you wanted to make sure you said now and just uh, offer you that opportunity. And Leah, we'll start with you. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'll just first uplift um, some of the great comments that came from our breakout session thinking about concepts that might no longer be able to be taught under these education gag orders, including the theory of evolution, climate change, um, the automatic suppression of knowledge. We talked a lot about what objectivity means and not having debate within classes anymore and how teaching is aligned to scholarship and student research. I would say that um, just to add, we didn't have as much time to talk about the role of, of researchers, but I think that that is very expansive and it could include, it can run the gamut from writing amicus briefs to serving as expert witnesses. Your research matters a lot and that's one of the ways that we've been trying to explain the impact on students and also on educators. This is relatively new, so there's not as much that we can point to, but we're hoping to find more information where we can point to courts and say, point the court to an expert and say, look, someone else who studied um, sees this. I would also say your own political activism calling your legislators, speaking to people about it, supporting banned books, having banned book clubs, all of that matters and talking to your colleagues, especially because this is happening at a level that is impacting people throughout education, but it's not necessarily felt immediately, um, even in states where there isn't an education gag ordered yet. And so I think those are all things, but I'd be happy to keep talking about this. Um, I, I thank you to my group. Y'all are amazing. I want to lift up a couple things in particular that I really appreciated. Um, one was our uh, internationalizing the conversation. We had conversations about resonances between Chicago and, and the U.S. and Chile. We talked about also the importance of what's actually going on in classrooms as a place of concern, control, but also as a place of opportunity um, and a place of excitement, particularly in thinking about young people and the things that they're bringing into those spaces. So I really wanna thank my group um, for lifting those things up as, as big takeaways for me. Thank you. Um, also shout out to everybody who's on my group because you did great. Um, a couple of the things that I didn't get to say, I wanted to piggyback on Leah's, uh, the, the things that you can do as individuals, some of them are much less formal than um, expert witness and, and testimony, but writing a letter to the editor of your local paper. Coming to a school board meeting, we, we want to make school board meetings boring again. <laughs> not, not all of them are as crazy and um, scary as the ones that you see on the news, but our educators and our school board members still feel isolated. Um, and under attack. So any friendly face that they can see in the crowd has value. So it, it doesn't require putting yourself out there, saying anything, just showing up. And, and they know that they have a friend in the crowd. Um, there was something else I wanted to say, and maybe it will come back to me after. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought about saying, well, I had a lousy group, that, but I won't do it. We had a great group, a lot of conversation and too much to summarize, I think. Um, we spent more time on anything else, on some of the tensions we face as researchers in the research community between wanting to help things and be between doing the science, doing the research seriously uh, in ways that are important. 
and a lot of discussion on complexity and the fact that when you know more about these issues, they're more complex, and, and yet there's many forums in which we're urged to simplify. You know, you're talking to a journalist or you're talking to a class or you get five minutes with a politician and you, and you have to tell a story that bleaches out the difference, differences from state to state. You have to tell a story that talks about a social movement as all, if all the members in the social movement have the same ideas and the same values and motivations and how to negotiate that tension of, of dealing with complexity without leading to uh, a recommendation of paralysis or that seems like a recommendation for paralysis. So um, the other issue that came up was the role of governance. And in a K-12 context, that's the school board, generally elected, sometimes appointed. But there's also a governance role in higher ed. And sometimes our trustees and board of governors are not the kinds of people who should be making the decisions that they're making. So thoughts about how faculty can e exert more influence on who gets into those seats. I wonder if I can have you all comment quickly about an issue that I think many um, early career scholars are, are feeling, especially um, so much of academic preparation is about neutrality and objectivity and, and holding back, right? Um, and, and this moment seems to be calling for the opposite of that. And so as we're talking about how research can and should matter, any thoughts you have for early career scholars and senior career scholars who are preparing them uh, to enter the field about how they should be navigating their own voices as researchers um, in this moment as they're trying to build careers but also be engaged in these very pressing civic moments. Um, I'm like, oh, I'm an academic up here. Let me answer the question. Um, I think for me, I feel like I just go back to my like, why? Why am I doing this work? Why did I decide to go to graduate school? Why did I, you know, in, if I think back to those moments and it was because I care deeply about black children and I wanna do work that impacts them. And for me, that came from a, also a love of history and trying to look over time and learn from those spaces over time. And so as long as the work, what I was doing felt aligned with that, to just keep moving in that direction. But I do think it's important to have like, you know, some basic principles and then you just follow along that. I said this in the in the room, when I think back to sort of like challenging moments or should I say this or should I do this, saying the thing, doing the thing, showing up somewhere that felt like the right thing to do always felt good afterwards. It was times where I pump faked or I wasn't sure or should I or shouldn't I that I later regretted or not regret, I mean, like deep regrets, you know what I mean, but little, little regrets. So I, I don't want to, you know, underestimate these various pressures of one's workplace and such. Um, and also to say that happens in every workplace, not just in, in academic spaces. Um, but I think that to like, just be like grounded and connected in your why um, in respect to while you're, how you're doing your work and going about your scholarship and your teaching, et cetera. And that in some places it may be amplified more in one space than another. So at one time it may be the teaching where it feels like I have more space to really pursue the things I care about. And in other times it's in the research or the public facing work or service work. And maybe it can't be all the things all the time back to the conversation we had this morning about wellness and resistance. But I think that there are ways to sort of amplify and dial up and dial down in different spaces while staying true to yourself. Because I say this often, more probably in the school board space than in my job, but the only thing I have to lose out here is my integrity and, and that I'm not willing. So I think that like that is also a helpful check for me. So I'm gonna take my advice about complexity by saying you know, I, I, I think about this a lot in terms of young scholars and and the institutional environment you're in can vary, I mean, in, in important ways. You know, I, I started out in a discipline based in political science in a school of arts and sciences. The culture and the expectations when I moved to Teachers College about that balance between speaking to the public, speaking to other scholars about addressing issues of social justice versus addressing issues of uh, enlightening, solving research problems in your field was totally different. So 
point number one, and I think we need to be pragmatic because I don't, one thing I don't want to ever do is in, you know, encourage a young scholar to follow a course that's going to end their careers. And you have to take ownership of your careers in ways that matter. But I'd, I'd add to that the, the fact, you know, and this is consistent, which is um, across the field, different people can put themselves at different places on this uh, continuum between changing the world and changing knowledge. Those aren't opposite ends, but you know, I mean, it, we don't all have to do the same thing. Some people have uh, different skill sets, different motivations, and, and I think that's a good thing for the field to encourage pluralism internally, but also across a career. You, you know, and this is, I think, is what you were saying as well, you know, is that um, you can do different things at different points. It's a reality that you can do different things when you have tenure than when you don't, for example. And if you're worried about that and fretting about that, you, you don't have to be embarrassed if you're making certain decisions uh, because you're at this very vulnerable stage. I wonder if um, Susan and Leah, you, you both said in your um, commentary that you, um, from your standpoint where you were working with the ACL, ACLU and AA, that you need our research. And I wonder if you can um, offer some ideas for us about how, how do we get our research to you? And, <laughs> um, and is, is, can you think of research that has been particularly impactful for the, the kind of work you're trying to do right now? Well, um, okay. Um, so unrelated to this, but research on staffing shortages is moving policy. So we have we have research on the the impact on the ground. We have the the data and the statistics that educators are leaving the classroom, students aren't entering the classroom. So the, the both ends of the pipeline are squeezed. This is the impact on schools and students and families, and, and we have the why. So salary and conditions of working, like conditions of teaching, but these threats are also impacting it. So that research is helping to move policy. One example. Yeah, I would say research that I found to be particularly helpful is about the targeted nature of education gag orders for black and BIPOC communities. Micah Pollock did an excellent report that I come back to all the time, which overlaid, I think, the map that Susan had, um, but basically showing that the places where this fight over anti-triple race theory are also the places where um, white enrollment in public schools has dropped more than 18%, and that connection can't be unseen, and the importance can't be overstated. Separate from education gag orders themselves, it is really important for us as attorneys to be able to point to the harms to students, um, the harms of educational gag orders. So we are in the process of trying to argue to the court that the Stop Woke Act targets black educators, but also black students. So there will be ripple effects for black students when they came to Florida State to study African American studies and they lost their professors or they lost these opportunities and the enrollment drop, like all of those things that we see happening down the pipeline, we have to establish that through expertise that is outside of the attorneys. And so thinking about the varied effects of not having um, this instruction on students and the varied effects on professors as well, both, I mean, there's lots of stories about people leaving these states, but we need to also just show like what does how am I saying this? Like how, let's just play it out for the court and have research that we can point to. Some of the things that we pointed to in the K-12 context have been um, studies about the impact of culturally relevant teaching methods on BIPOC students or students with marginalized identities. We've also talked about um, the denial of these methods primarily impacting these students. Um, there's a lot of research about how the impact of these methods on students of color, but also research on the impact of these methods on white students as well, because we can say it's not just about BIPOC students, we, you know, these 
methodologies benefit everyone, but each one of these um, arguments that we're trying to build out about why this matters, particularly in the student right to information, we need research to back it up, both research and researchers to serve as experts to walk us through that, do a literature review as part of their um, expert report. And then also, I meant to say earlier, so I'll take the opportunity that as professors or academics, you can serve as a plaintiff and we would love that, but there's other ways to participate even lower than that. Um, if you're not in a position where you want to serve as a plaintiff, you can serve as a declarant and just submit an affidavit, which doesn't make you a party to the case, but lets us tell your story as well. Or even reaching out to attorneys um, to talk about what you've seen and connecting us with people who feel comfortable standing up. There is no connection that's too small. And we also are thinking about ways of highlighting the impact across disciplines because this really feels like social sciences and it's kind of been built that way like you know by legislators this is just that group it's not the hard sciences and one of our professor plaintiffs and Purnell is a statistics professor who can talk about he talks about the very like race as a variable and he gets into concepts that are now prohibited by the stop woke act and we need to also point to people across other disciplines that aren't in the ones that immediately come to mind. So just if you see ways that you were impacted by um, an education gag order and they seem outside of the normal discourse or the immediate thought, we want to put those before the court just to show the broad array. I was going to say something I, I feel like I've learned as a researcher who now sits in some policy making spaces. Um, and this is maybe more practical <laughs> advice, but we need to learn how to write very concisely, y'all. Like one page or max, people do not read. They don't, they don't have time sometimes, they don't care to, maybe a lower, like staffer may read more in depth, but generally speaking, you need your one page memo and maybe a paragraph or just some bullet points. I think also sometimes school districts and other entities as well have sort of go to either individual researchers or think tanks where they generally get their research or a center where they normally get their research from and keep going back to those places over and over. And it can feel hard to break break into that. And I'd say particularly as a junior person, one of the things you were saying that I think is really important is relationship building. So if you work on, I'm quote picking, out of school time, Figure out who is the person in your local district who's maybe like a director or manager level working on that topic and tell them about, you know, reach out to them, tell them about your work, maybe offer to participate in some action research or something, bring something to the table for potential collaboration. But I think those relationships, if you don't have big name, big money, big budget behind you, big center behind you, still as an individual researcher, I think even more in those cases, that relationship building um, is really important. And for elected officials in particular, you need to go to their staffers, not them, and figure out who the staffer is, who's their policy staffer if you're doing policy. And also that it's not just elected officials and political officials, but you can do research for unions, you can do research you know, in collaboration with other nonprofit groups or various other community-based organizations as another way to sort of get into that space of having your research live outside of maybe just peer-reviewed journals or these other spaces if you want to impact the policy realm. Yes, yes, yes. NEA has a research department, it's eight people, right? It, and it's not doing the research that you do. So we, we work with the National Education Policy Center, we work with the Great Lakes Center, and they compile research of what works that we can use to say do this instead of that, to quote someone. Um, <laughs> um, so there, like, there are ways, there are avenues to get that research into the hands of advocates who can help you with that translation of research into reports. And I think I you know I, I might have hurt some feelings when I said I don't read your methodology section. <laughs> Can I add one quick thing? Just along those lines, um, when you were all were talking, it was reminding me that when you submit your research, so let's say you see a law coming, you know it's going to have bad effects, find a friendly legislator and send them your research, but they can also help 
you can work with them to plant questions that they ask on the legislative floor to come up with talking points, to come up with materials, because when we come in as lawyers on the back end, we're relying on the foreseeability of this impact, and we want to be able to show that. And if you have research that you've shared with a legislature, legislator who has told it to the entire legislature, now they know. And that's a, a record that could really be helpful, especially as we're litigating equal protection or racially discriminatory claims. Wonderfully helpful and insightful, and I hope the conversation will continue. Um, before I bring this incredible panel to a close, I have some important information to communicate um, about a reception and dinner tonight. So um, it, it will be at the Fairmont Hotel um, at 6.30. Those of you staying at the courtyard, there will be a bus to pick you up at 6 o'clock. Uh, if you want to go that route. And um, for members at the who are meeting here at the Academy, there will be a bus at 545 at 21st and C. So you have been informed that, about that. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists uh, for today. Thank you so much. And thank you to President Carroll for supporting this panel. Um, and we look forward to the conversations continuing. Take care.